Good evening and a very warm, warm welcome uh, to all of you. My name is Robin Celikates and uh, together with my colleague Rahel Yegi, I'm directing the Center for Social Critique Berlin, um, who's, which is uh, organizing this uh, panel event tonight. And it's a really great pleasure to welcome all of you here uh, to chair this panel and to welcome our panelists. Um, we live in a somewhat paradoxical situation when it comes to structural racism. Um, on the one hand, it's clear that this uh, concept has um, been very prominent in anti-racist struggles, um, recently especially, uh, in social movements such as Black Lives Matter, but also in um, the new wave of critical theorizing about race and racism um, that has emerged both in the US but also in Europe, also in Germany. Um, and this new wave of theorizing has really focused our attention on the structural nature of uh, racism. Um, it brought racism into view as a social problem, a social structural problem or a relational phenomenon that goes much deeper than individual attitudes um, or issues of diversity. Uh, of course, evidence for this existence of structural racism has been abundant for a long time. Um, if you look at uh, sociological studies of the housing market, if you look at the segregation um, and stratification of the labor market, um, if you look at access to loans and credit, if you look at public health as um, evidenced by the uh, disproportionate impact, again, of the COVID pandemic on racialized populations, if you look at police violence and the criminal justice system, uh, if you look at the border regime and migration policies, they all uh, disparately and disproportionately impact um, racialized populations. Um, and all of this um, uh, relatively independently of um, individual agents, their attitudes, their behaviors, um, whether professed or not. On the other hand, of course, there's um, an ongoing backlash against the notion of structural racism. Um, against largely imaginary constructions of uh, critical uh, race uh, theory, and it's presumably ideological or unscientific usage of terms like racism or structural racism. Um, this goes from uh, Florida, where the governor and possible next president of the United States, Ron DeSantis, has been waging an anti-woke campaign in which issues of um, structural racism play uh, an important ideological role. Um, DeSantis' lawyers called the belief that there are systemic injustices in America uh, one of the core notions of the woke ideology they are uh, about to um, ban and uh, repress. Um, but it's also a phenomenon that we can see in Germany, of course, where from the IFD to certain voices in the public debate, to journalists, um, academics, uh, even social scientists and scholars in the humanities, there are uh, various attacks on um, both anti-racist activism and um, concepts such as structural racism. Now, in this kind of ideological war that is going on, uh, there is maybe a tiny kernel of truth in that this notion of structural racism is indeed um, still somewhat under-theorized and often quite vague when it is invoked so widely as we see it being invoked today. And it is precisely against this background that um, in this panel tonight we want to explore questions such as the precise nature of uh, structural racism. What makes structural racism structural? What does it mean to speak of structural racism and its relation to, let's say, for example, institutional or systemic or individual uh, racism? And if racism is indeed structural, what does this imply for anti-racist struggles and social movements and their transformative orientation? To explore these and other issues. We are very fortunate to have four fantastic panelists uh, here with us uh, this evening. Um, from my left to my right, uh, Bafta Zabo, Sally Hasslinger, Daniel James, and Christina Leopold. Thanks so much to all of you for accepting our invitation. 
Um, let me just very briefly introduce our panelists. You should read their work and uh, also follow them on social media if you haven't done so yet, because uh, in their work and in their activism, in their uh, published academic work, but also in what uh, those of them who use social media, what they post, there's really a lot to learn about all these ongoing uh, debates. Um, I'll start again on my left with BAFTA. BAFTA is a social scientist and activist based here in Berlin, whose work is situated at the intersection of anti-racist uh, struggles and theorizing and Marxism. She has recently published the edited volume, The, the Diversität der uh, Ausbeutung, The Diversity of Exploitation, um, which has been much discussed and is um, already kind of bestseller in um, this uh, section of uh, anti-racist literature. She's also politically active on the board of um, Schwarze, the Initiative Schwarze Menschen in Deutschland, Initiative Black People in Germany, and has focused uh, both in her academic and activist work on police violence, migration, and racism uh, in Germany. Uh, on my right is Sally Hesslinger, who is a Ford Professor of Philosophy at MIT, where she also teaches in the Women's and Gender Studies program. She has uh, written widely and influentially on issues of race and racism. There's now also a German translation of uh, some of her work um, in the book Die Wirklichkeit, Der Wirklichkeit widerstehen, translated by Daniel, who's sitting uh, next to her. And we are very fortunate to have Sally here in Berlin for um, a bit longer because she's the Benjamin Chair at our center uh, currently, and she will uh, give the Benjamin Lectures uh, from June 14 to June 16 uh, under the title Agents of Possibility, the Complexity of Social Change. Uh, next to Sally is Daniel James, who is a philosopher and uh, currently postdoctoral researcher and assistant professor in political theory at the Technical University in Dresden. He published widely on Hegel, racism, and Hegel and racism, and uh, is uh, also very active on social media. He is also um, uh, done really interesting empirical work on the relation between the terms race and Rasse, um, and is very much engaged in public debates about structural racism uh, here in Germany. And next to Daniel is Christina Leopold, who is a professor of uh, social philosophy and critical theory at Humboldt Universität uh, Berlin and on the board of uh, SWIP Germany, so it's a Society for Women in Philosophy. And she has recently co-edited the reader Critical Philosophy of Race with Surkamp, which for the first time in the German debate makes uh, some of the seminal texts of this newly emerging philosophical field um, accessible to a broader German um, audience. And her current research focuses on um, institutional racism, among other things. Okay, now we'll first have a debate here on the panel uh, for around um, the first hour or so. Um, and in the second half, we'll open it up to the public. You're all invited to ask questions then. Um, and uh, I'll explain how we do that when, we're, um, when we get there. Um, just one more note, we are recording this event, um, but the camera is only facing the panel, so you're not being recorded. Um, but if you are asking a question later, this will be on the audio uh, recording. So just um, for your information, you don't have to identify yourself if you're asking a question, so we hope that's okay for everyone. Okay, now um, I would like to start um, with a rather fundamental uh, theoretical question concerning um, the question of structural race, the, the concept of structural racism. Um, and maybe begin uh, with you, Sally, because uh, much of your work has turned around um, the structural nature of racism and uh, also the notion of structure itself, what structural explanations are, how they differ from, for example, individualist in explanations. Um, so I would like to ask you to start us off um, with some thoughts on um, the theoretical and maybe also political point of the concept of structural racism in the context of the work that you are doing, what role does that notion play in um, academic and maybe also activist work? Um, and maybe also how has the debate uh, changed into which you tried to intervene over the last uh, years, maybe even decades in, in this respect? Thank you so much, Robin, and thank you all for coming. It's a real honor to be here and to be part of this panel. Thank you. Um, so, 
I think that as you pointed out in the introduction, the main impetus to talk about structural racism is to take it out of the minds and the heads of individuals as if um, racism is just bigotry, as if, well, you're a racist, you're a racist, whatever, and your individual actions are the, the source of the problem. Um, and, and initially, I think the, the move was to think about institutional racism, so laws, so for example, in the United States, and I will speak mainly about the United States because I don't know as much about Germany, is you know, voting rights, right? The voting rights were limited. I mean, if we can go all the way back to slavery, of course, but under Jim Crow, there was mandated segregation and, and African-Americans didn't have um, voting rights, et cetera, et cetera. And this is, it's not as if somebody had a bad attitude towards someone going up to the poll and saying, I'm sorry, you're black, I'm not gonna let you vote. It had nothing to do with that. It had to do with a law that prevented voting. And if you look at Native Americans, I mean, the, the terrible, basically genocide of, of uh, Native Americans, it wasn't about people just getting it in their heads that they were gonna go shoot some Indians as, you know, the way it made it look um, in some movies. It was, you know, an institutionalized regime that was appropriating land and preventing uh, Native Americans from being part of the polity, giving them terrible lands, moving them onto, onto very um, depleted uh, lands. Um, and so these are part of the history was just, look, you have to look at the laws, the policies, um, the ways that that um, it was an organized system to, to uh, produce these results. Um, so I think institutional and legal was the first move to think about structural racism. Um, I think the informal notion is also very important and comes up in my work as well. So I, the way I think about this is that there are a set of social meanings that are part of culture, and these social meanings are, are signals to people um, to behave certain ways, to do certain things. So, you know, in English, as in German, there are different um, kinds of personal pronouns, sort of masculine and feminine personal pronouns. And infants, it's hard to tell um, what pronouns to use because, you know, they don't present their genitals to you. Um, and so you dress them in pink or blue so people know what pronouns to use. And so, but the same is true about race. There are many ways of signaling race and picking up on those signals of race without necessarily having biased attitudes or negative attitudes. You're just kind of going through a process of interpreting and reading people's clothing, people's hairstyles, people's way of responding in the world, the way of speaking. And on the radio, for example, there's you know, accents, there's a kind of an African-American vernacular. And the minute that African-American vernacular comes on, people are going to start assuming things about the speaker. And so that's a kind of signaling. And I don't think it's conscious, I don't even think it's re reasonable to say in most cases that it's unconscious as well. I think that they're just disposed to respond in certain ways um, to certain signals, just the way people are we're always responding. So in this, it becomes structural in that it gives people a kind of choice architecture. And I'll give you a simplistic example, but my, my colleague, I have a black colleague in linguistics, and it's very common in philosophy in the in our department that people, especially the guys, they wear t-shirts and jeans. And he had found that if he just wore t-shirts and jeans to teach, um, then people would assume he was a member of the custodial staff, that he was a janitor because he's black. And so he dresses up and looks nice and wears a jacket, you know, button down shirt and everything. And, and he would, when he was up for renewal, the department head said, I don't know, you're very aggressive. Did you know that you're very, even your clothing is aggressive. And he was like, what? What? How can my clothing be aggressive? I'm just, I'm just looking, I'm just dressing up. But you see these, this, this frame of options he was given was either you wear a t-shirt and you're considered a janitor or you wear a button down shirt and a jacket and you're considered aggressive. So there's a kind of choice architecture that was set up for him that wasn't about policies. It was about signaling and what you signal and who signals what and how to be legible. And he was left being illegible. He had no way to be legible as a thoughtful, 
um, linguist just being a professor at the university. So I think that's a kind of example of a more informal way that, that our choices are shaped not by laws and policies and institutions, but by these kind of social meanings. Great, thank you, Sally. Um, maybe to um, open the range of theoretical options of understanding how the structural uh, force of racism operates, so if I understand correctly, yours would be a kind of, say, practice and culture-based account in which um, the options that individuals ha have are very much uh, constrained uh, by the way in which uh, the culture is organized um, and the ways in which uh, the practices individuals are caught up in either enable them or don't enable them to to do certain things, and and especially for uh, maybe people who 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 profit from these forms of structural constraints or who, not, who are not as constrained, uh, that can be quite invisible, as your department had who didn't seem to have any awareness of that. Um, maybe turning to you, Bafta. One other way of explaining the structural um, nature of uh, racism, so the fact that racism is not just an optional kind of add-on to some of our societies, is to look at um, the relation between racism and capitalism that has played an important role in your um, work. Um, yeah, could you talk a bit about how, the, or whether the notion of structural racism makes sense to you, how you would spell it out from a kind of sort of theoretical point of view? But also maybe if you think that it has, um, you know, any kind of importance for your political uh, work. So yeah, as you already said, my work is um, concerned with the relationship between racism and capitalism. So um, I think in that case, the relationship between um, the concept of structural racism, institutional racism, we can maybe discuss on the details later, is um, a good starting point for the discussion um, we are trying to propose. So you started with, you know, it takes racism out of the heads, it understands racism as something structural that is not only bigotry, but something that is, um, yeah, not only um, relevant to individual people and how they think about society, so I think this is a good point to start, but then the concept of structural racism can mean a lot of things, a lot of different things. Um, I think it has a potential in bringing together a lot of different theories that agree on this specific fact, and I think from a political standpoint that has a lot of potential, um, but it also has the potential to be very vague because um, in my political experience, sometimes people say structural racism, but what they actually mean is just the fact that they are that there are a lot of racist people in a society, um, as opposed to not many racist people in a society. So, um, I think we would agree that that's not what structural racism means, but it's kind of the way the term is used nowadays, especially since. I would say since um, 2020 and the protests around Black Lives Matter, the discussion about racism um, in the US and Germany, but also globally has changed. And people are now more open to talk about structural racism. And I think it has the potential to be filled with a useful concept. And I think it makes sense to look at racism um, not only as a form of ideology, but as a social relation that um, is not only concerned with um, how people are coded and how people are thought of, but um, the question of how does, um, where does this um, yeah, racist prejudice come from? Like why would somebody who's white, for example, assume that somebody who's black is a janitor? Of course that's racist, but it's also not far from the truth because in the US as a black person, you are more likely to be a janitor than a professor. So that is also a social reality. And I think when we talk about racism and when we talk about structural racism, we cannot separate the social reality from the ideology. And I think the racism doesn't begin at the ideo ideological part, but with the fact that our society is already organized in a specific way, that black people, for example, are predominantly part of the working class. And um, I would say, makes sense when we talk about structural racism to talk about the conditions of capitalism that organize society in such a way and that doesn't mean that 
there's, you know, there's some kind of conspiracy of the ruling class to, you know, put black people in the working class or something, but that there's of course a structural reason that has to do with the way the capitalist world market is also organized. And starting from that, that would kind of disconnect um, the concept of racism from being only um, yeah, a form of ideology um, that is in people's heads, but that is in the very social structure we live in. But that would um, also disconnect racism from the concept that it has to be um, motivated. Um, there's this uh, great study by um, Eric Williams called Capitalism and Slavery, where he says that slavery doesn't come from racism, racism comes from slavery. And I think this is like a very good concept of how to think about these social relations and to connect yeah, racism to capitalist class societies and understand it in a more holistic way. So structural in this case would mean um, some a specific framework of capitalist class societies. Thank you. Um, Daniel, maybe uh, I can ask you to say a bit about how you see the relation between the ideological and the social relational or social practical or structural. Um, I mean, I think there is probably general agreement here that we shouldn't think in too many dichotomies here and that any workable notion of the ideological ha has to be one that is, you know, let's say, practice theoretical for the moment or materialist. Uh, but still, I think it's a question of how exactly these are um, um, related. So, um, yeah, how do you, how, if at all, do you use the notion of structural racism in your work, and how would you think about that uh, relation that Bafta just talked about between the ideological and the material organization of society um, that that we might also, you know, describe or analyze from uh, another theoretical point of view? Yeah, yeah. <coughs> thanks for the question, and first of all, thanks uh, to both of you Raul and Robin for inviting us. I'm really happy to be here, here this panel, a bit nervous as you can tell, but uh, hopefully it'll be all right. Um, um, yeah, I think, so generally, I, uh, the, the approach I'm seeking is one that sort of asks, you know, okay, what, what's supposed to be the point of this concept? And I think one point I'm particularly interested in is having a concept of, of structural racism that can guide, uh, at the end, empirical inquiry into you know, racialized disparities and these things. That can be one project that can coexist with many other ones, but that's just one thing I'm particularly interested in. So think, again, as Robin just mentioned, think of the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic had on different um, racialized uh, populations or groups. Maybe we can say a little bit more about uh, how I would try to make sense of that later. But uh, just to mention uh, that example, and I think sort of you know, the concept I think that might serve that purpose very well would be an understanding of, of racism as what I would call racialized oppression. Um, and um, you know, I, I like to think of racialization sort of as a, there's a, there's a paper that says that race is a bundle of sticks. So I like to say racialization is a bundle of sticks. You have all these different sticks that sort of lead to the racialization of groups. This might be how people are represented, how they are treated, uh, but there can also be other factors. There could be social economic factors. And in the end, there can be sort of very brute material factors as well. So. Um, Think, for instance, of, uh, uh, think of, uh, of a social system such as the city. Uh, so in the city, of course, you'll have institutions, you have all these rules, you have people that have different roles in these institutions. But of course, there's also a, a material side to that city. Uh, it has roads, it has, uh, it has railways, it has, it has its infrastructure on all these things. And if you look, for instance, at a phenomenon such as ghettoization, say like de, de facto um, housing segregation, something like that, then um, a variety of factors will contribute to that, but one part of that might also be, uh, well, which roads lead out of the ghetto, for instance? Yeah? How do you even get to a good workplace? Yeah? How, can you, how, does, how does the infrastructure, for instance, um, shape um, the kind of social networks you can form to get to certain positions and all those things? And I think one question I'm really interested in, and I'm not quite sure to which extent um, is a different view than you know, the, the, the one of racism as ideology or social relation, but maybe it's a different way of accentuating the, uh, the phenomenon in question, um, is to think that maybe there are, um, there are certain things uh, that themselves sort of materialize racial oppression. So you might think that the, 
the infrastructure of a city, um, to some extent at least, materializes racial oppression. And I think that's the one side that I'm particularly interested in because I find uh, that's one that's um, particularly uh, uh, resistant, I think, to, to change. And um, um, yes, I think that's what can lead to this kind of oppression becoming very, uh, very entrenched. So I think that would be one factor uh, that I would like to highlight. Um, and that might uh, um, uh, definitely uh, interacts with the cultural, the ideological, the social practical side. Uh, I guess one question I'm interested in is to which extent might it even materialize such an impression independently of, of that cultural and ideological side. But uh, yeah, that, at that point, at this point, this is just a question I'm really interested in. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Christina, I mean, one one could imagine someone saying, um, you know, let's take the the disproportionate impact of um, the COVID nineteen um, epidemic on on pandemic on on racialized populations, that this is a function of you know both some individual forms of racism, you know, politicians taking decisions that. Um, are just not playing out equally for different parts of the population. It might also be um, an effect of certain forms of institutional racism. So let's say within the medical system, in hospitals, etc., there might be certain institutional logics, um, the language being used, uh, etc., that disadvantage racialized populations. Um, what, if any, um, added value does the concept of structural racism have in this context? I mean, you yourself work on institutional racism, um, and uh, often, as I mentioned at the beginning, these are sort of lumped up, and people tend to identify everything that goes beyond the individual psychology of uh, people and their racist attitudes. Uh, they tend to lump it together, so there's no very clear separation between institutional, structural, or systemic uh, racism. Um, I was wondering how you would account for that distinction, especially between institutional and structural racism. I mean, is there something that goes beyond the institutional level in your view, or could one sort of try to explain almost all there is to the way racism organize, uh, is organized in our societies on the institutional um, level? Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you, Robin, and also for the invitation. Um, so. Perhaps, like, let me start by saying a bit about why I think that institutional racism is still like an important concept, uh, even though structural racism, systemic racism, are certainly in other respects like more important um, explanatory concepts. Um, but I think so. Perhaps, like, to give you some background, um, the term institutional racism was introduced. Um, in the 60s in the U.S. by Stokely Carmichael and Charles Hamilton in their book um, Black Power. And interestingly, at a time when um, segregation uh, had been outlawed and blacks or Afro-American uh, people had already achieved um, voting rights, as Sally pointed out earlier. So they wrote the book at a time when that was already achieved, but still there were still sort of widespread um, material uh, inequalities and also inequalities when it comes to healthcare, et cetera, education, et cetera, et cetera. And they sort of introduced um, the concept of institutional racism to account for this or to have like a concept that could explain this. And um, so I'm mainly interested in institutional racism because it is a concept that is still used in activist circles today. Um, I mean, BAFTA uh, probably knows much more about this than I do um, because she's actually working on this in the German context. But in the German context, uh, we've had a public debate for several years now on um, whether there is institutional racism within the German police. I mean, there have been uh, many incidents in which the German police uh, has failed to uh, properly respond to certain crimes and attacks against members of certain racialized groups. Think of Hanau and the NSU complex as just the most prominent examples. There, has, there have been incidents of police violence and also there is like widespread racial profiling. And I guess that is a context in which um, activists still talk about institutional racism and in which I uh, sort of <laughs> would situate my own work because I think it is important to get a clearer understanding of what institutional racism is. Um, and so now some people think that institutional racism just is a specific form of structural racism and that is because we focus on institutional structures in the sense of rules but not only legal or formal rules but also like informal norms, procedures, practices 
Um, and so there is a sense of structure involved here, <clears throat> and this is why some people say, or use like the terms institutional racism and structural racism interchangeably. Um, and I'm perfectly fine with this way of talking about it, and I think it would allow us to um, sort of uh, think that structural racism is like the broader category, structures in the sense of norms, rules, practices, et cetera, et cetera, are pervasive in social life. There are many structures that organize our individual behavior. And then there are some institutional structures, and that's where when we start to talk about institutional racism. So that <clears throat> would be one way of connecting it to the topic of uh, structural racism. But I should also say that I have no um, stakes in what exactly we should label structural racism. I mean, I find much common ground with what all of you said. I think that the institutions I'm talking about, the institution of the police, um, is embedded in a capitalist society, in a nation state, is interacting with other institutions like uh, schools, um, the prison, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so it's important to see that, and I'm not really sure um, <laughs> for what specific aspect of all of this I want to reserve the sort of word um, structural. I'm happy with, like, I mean, so we should, I, I think we should sort of be careful not to um, enter into like a merely verbal dispute about the term structural, um, yeah. Yeah, sure, please. So one thing that we didn't talk about yet is systemic racism, and I think, um, Sometimes I like to think about the systemic as, so the, the structural, it's kind of like a roadmap where you get the relations and the different things that are being related. But one of the things I find very important is that there's a dynamics here. So for example, between the cultural and the material, there is this dynamic so that the material can, can give rise to the cultural and then the cultural can reinforce the material. And so it's a, it's not a static thing, it's a process. And I think all of these different parts of it, the, the materiality of it, the cultural part of it, the personal part of it, they're all part of an interacting sort of process that, that creates an equilibrium where it seems as though we're stuck. We're stuck with this, where of course we have these different access points then in the culture and in the material conditions and in the individuals. So I just wanted to add systemic to the picture. Thank you. Um, maybe Bafta, question to you. I mean, so even if we make these distinctions in in theory, I mean, do they have a point in activist practice? Or I mean, if you, you've you've done a lot of both research on and political work on or against um, police uh, violence and racism as it is uh, manifested in the police. I mean, in, in your work there, does it make a difference whether we think about institutional racism? I mean, it's clear that individual racism is not enough, but does it make a difference whether we think about institutional racism and structural racism? Where, where does the embeddedness of the police in, for example, capitalist structures and their own logic come in? Because it's, it might seem that this is at an abstract level that is hard to relate to the more activist engagement with that institution. Um. Yeah, I know it can seem that way, but I think this is uh, very much at the core of a lot of debates um, within the activist field on um, racism within the police. So I think um, institutional racism as a concept would make sense to use it for the police as an institution to see, okay, what is um, the structural logic of police work? Um, there's, uh, for example, a certain reason why there are um, overproportionately um, people with right-wing beliefs within the police, um, a specific culture of masculinity, for example, and of course also um, a lot more people with racist beliefs than within the average society. So I think uh, when we talk about this, and it makes sense to talk about this, um, institutional racism as a concept would make sense. Um, but I think it's also important to go um, maybe to a higher level, to a more abstract level, and look at the police as an institution um, connected to, as you said, um, their function in capitalist society, but also within the state. Because when we look at uh, racial profiling in Germany, um, other than in the US, in Germany, racial profiling is very much um, directed um, at very specific people the police assumes to be um, illegals, to um, 
uh, cross the border illegally and what they are looking for are people who are illegal migrants that they could um, uh, deport back to wherever they come from. So when we look at this kind of um, legal framework that exists in Germany, um, the migration regime, uh, the laws the police operate on, of course, this has nothing to do with the police itself, but with the laws they are enforcing. So for me, I couldn't imagine a non-racist migration control because it is also embedded in something that I would also call racist, that is the way migration policy is, um, yeah, uh, exists in Germany. And this also has nothing to do with the police, but with the migration regime we live in. So that would be a case where I would talk about structural racism. So there are specific policies when we talk about racist police violence that are more on the reformist side, but that I would think would make sense to, um, defund the police, to lessen police capacities, and um, to abolish these kinds of, um, in Germany we call them dangerous places, that are places where the police can just, um, uh, yeah, basically um, go around and uh, stop and, yeah, in English I think you would call it stop and frisk, but I'm not sure. Um, and it would be possible on a legal level to just abolish that, and that would, change some of the police work, I think, but it wouldn't change it overall because this directive of migration control doesn't just go away. So I think these are different levels where I would talk about institutional racism in one case and structural racism in another case because I would consider the term structural racism to be a lot more, yeah, yeah, to be on a higher level. And I think when in, in um, activists, um, circles when we talk about, for example, specific campaigns we are doing, these discussions are actually at the core because we have to discuss about what we think is the actual problem when we talk about racial profiling in Germany. So um, maybe to contrast it to um, another position that I think nobody on this panel would hold is that the mainstream position in Germany is actually that what you need is more anti-racism workshops in um, yeah, police education or like diversity workshops or more a, a more diverse police itself. And that would be uh, an understanding of racism that wouldn't understand it as something structural, I would say. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe, Sally, can I ask you to speak to that complex um, how, and I mean, also in the US, there's, there's simply at the moment is extremely I mean, to call it heated is under <laughs> is, is is not really adequate because it's politically weaponized and made into a new kind of sort of culture war scenario. I mean, how in this context where there is this massive backlash, not just on a discursive level, but you know, using state repression, using uh, basically legal means to forbid um, uh, public institutions from even talking about certain things, um, what do you think is the possible response to this? Um, situation. I mean, it's different across different states in the US, of course, but um, I would just be interested. I mean, there's, so on the one hand, we have the, the, the risk, as Bafta pointed out, of this kind of, let's say, liberal anti-racism that is too individualist and too psychologizing um, and suggests that, you know, a couple of diversity uh, trainings and anti-racist trainings, anti-bias trainings might help us fix the problem. Um, but on the other hand, we have this other even worse, maybe, risk or threat of, um, you know, just um, openly right-wing and, in the, in the end, openly racist um, uh, politicians and, and uh, social movements even, um, which seem to put those who advocate for a structural understanding of racism and for a radically transformative political response to that very much on the defensive. So... Yeah, what's your what's your view of the of the state of the struggle in this respect? <laughs> well, it's a firestorm. I mean, it's a it's a it's a terrible situation in the U.S. right now. Fortunately, I live in Massachusetts, which is a deep blue state. It's a very very um, committed to. I mean, of the American states, it's one of the ones that is most um, committed to anti-racist work. I believe. Um, so I think the, 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 some of the attacks 
are very surprising and interesting in an American context because they are banning books, they're banning the use of, of critical race theory in schools, they're banning, so there's a, uh, this is a separate issue, but it gives you a flavor for it, that school teachers who use the term gay are, are subject to being fired, right? It's like, really? I mean, we, the, what is the First Amendment for if it's not for, for this? And so, they, so what's interesting is that there are people with lots of money who made these huge billboards that just say gay on them in Florida, right? And so there's you know, a little bit of capitalism going in there, <laughs> sort of, you know, people who have lots of money trying to intervene, but I don't think that's the solution, of course. Um, so one, one thing I, I do think is that uh, there is a broad range of people that we can mobilize to protect libraries and to protect education and protect speech. And that in, in Florida, um, there, I think even in Florida, there are people who are horrified by what the governor does, and a lot of it is not democratically supported. Um, so one of the, I don't know if this was the question you were asking, but I think some of what you do is you take the background cultural you know, principles that are usually not upheld, but in the face of this kind of um, uh, you know, fight, um, they, I think that you can mobilize people around them. And, and there are people who are mobilizing around it. I don't think that, I mean, I think it's, it's not guaranteed to succeed, but I would find it very unlikely that in the long run, um, these kind of measures about speech and education are, are going to fail. But of course, that's what they want to do. They want to rewrite history. They want to sort of erase, and, and part, I mean, maybe this is part of it too, is that they, they don't want to take responsibility for things that they didn't individually do. So they say, oh yeah, there was slavery, but that was a long time ago. No one is doing that now, so we're all good, and we're just going to erase that from the history books. Sort of erasing that history, but also erasing any sense of responsibility. But, you know, there's still a lot of states where they're going to keep teaching this and going to te keep speaking of it and there are lots of publications that are going to do it and you know we have the internet so I mean I think it's going to be very hard to completely rewrite the history maybe I'm optimistic maybe that's overly optimistic yeah well I hope I hope you're right <laughs> it's yeah it's obviously happening in other countries as well so um, that's a challenge I think that's not limited to the so can I say one of the things that's so bizarre about this is that, you know, there's been a long history of people on the left being silenced in the U.S. and feminists being silenced and all of this. And, and then there's this also this now people who are on the right and they say something offensive and they're deplatformed and it's all about, oh no, I've been deplatformed, my, my rights have been denied. So it's, a, it's just people are coming from all over the place, right? Of, of, oh, the left are silencing the right, the right is silencing the left, it's all just back and forth and back and forth. We're in a, in a period of chaos, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, and it seems that um, this, t this type of claim where, you know, now people, some people say in the US, but also in Germany actually, that it's now, um, uh, you know, white people who are the subject of something like reverse racism, that only seems to be possible if you abstract racism from this structural embeddedness in histor histories of um, you know, racial oppression and injustice and ongoing structures of inequality in these different areas that we talked about, because only then can you have the thought even that um, that is not what is happening, but yeah. precisely that, that's the way in which this concept seems to circulate and um, to also then be, be is, is turned around. Right, because it's all about the non-structural analysis of racism, it's all about bigotry, because mm -hmm. we're all individualists, and so if there's going to be any way that you can blame white people, you're gonna have to blame them individually for their bad thoughts and actions, and otherwise, white people are innocent, right? And so this whole notion of structural racism, which situates white people as the dominant group, the privileged group, or whatever, they've got to erase it, mm. because otherwise it interferes with this idea that, oh, 
we're, we're just good people doing good things and, and you can't say that I'm a racist. That's, that's the attitude. Um, and so the history and the ways, and I mean, I think part of it is the ways in which we benefit. I mean, I talk about the ways that I've benefited from racism so deeply in every aspect of my life I've benefited by being white. And, but nobody, you know, the people who are opposed to, you know, critical race theory just want to say, oh no, you just have to judge me based on my speech and my attitudes. You can't sort of talk about where it all came mm -hmm. from, my privilege, my advantage, my, my economic benefits and all mm -hmm. of that. That's going to be erased. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel, I mean, in, in, the, in the German context, um, you know, Christina mentioned this earlier. I mean, it's it's sort of understandable that the Interior Ministry is not so happy with the idea that the police could be institutionally or structurally racist. There's an obvious um, sort of vested interest in not really wanting to talk about this, apart from the few bad apples that they might be willing to admit. Um, but there's also a broader resistance to thinking about racism at all in Germany, but especially if you... Uh, think of it in terms of institutional or structural racism. I mean, where in your understanding does this come from and why is it so, well, polarizing or contested? And what do you think can, I mean, wh what do you think your work, for example, or philosophical work in general can contribute to addressing this, uh, this kind of um, seemingly politically motivated um, uh, resistance against these terms? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Is it on? Yeah, good, all right, cool. Uh, I mean, very general, generally, um, uh, you know, I like to think of you know, contested concepts as concepts where there, there's a variety of conceptions that people have different ways of understanding the concept, and then what they actually fight about is sort of what is the right way uh, to understand this concept. And I think what makes uh, it, very generally speaking, just very messy, this, this applies to uh, other places just as much as to Germany, is uh, that racism is what uh, some people in philosophy call a, a thick ethical concept. So it has sort of both descriptive, maybe even explanatory, and evaluative components. And maybe they're even sort of inextricably intertwined. So you could say, you know, to call something racist is you know, to call for action, right? You want to say that, um, that whatever you are calling racist is, um, you know, is obviously wrong, unjust, something like that. Uh, and has to be changed. I think this is sort of a really important thing. Uh, because, I've, again, very generally, maybe people, different groups, different interests, um, um, they will be uh, more or less inclined or willing to change the things in question, for instance. So um, I think that's sort of, these are two very important factors, just very generally speaking. And then the third one is, and I think this one definitely applies uh, to the German context, is, uh, well, um, uh, who has a say now in sort of determining uh, what we understand uh, uh, by racism. And in that sense, you could say, well, there's also something of a, of a power struggle going on um, where uh, uh, minoritized groups uh, um, are attempting to have more of a say uh, uh, when it comes uh, uh, to our understanding of racism and then find an understanding that is more uh, in, in their interests, um, whereas there might be pushback uh, from the majority precisely because of the kind of action that that might call for. And I'll put this very, very generally, just to sort of have like a, a broad um, 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 roadmap. I think uh, this explains a lot of why um, um, debates over racism are, um, are so loaded and contested. Uh, so of course, if you start calling uh, an, an institution such as the police uh, racist, then um, that is, again, a call for action and that can be very fundamental depending on how deep, uh, deeply entrenched you take that problem to be. So, of course, the resistance against sort of an understanding of racism that would then sort of adequately apply to the police is also resistance just to changing the institution in question. Um, and then, you know, I do think to some extent also uh, that there will be resistance to uh, giving up what Germans like to call um, Deutungsmacht, so like it's quite a hermeneutic power or something like that. Um, so I think that's definitely a part of it. But I do think there's something that's sort of very peculiar to, to Germany, um, and um, that has to do with just a lot of the general terminology um, that we would need um, to talk about racism in the first place, or address racism in the first place. Uh, you know, 
if you look at some kind of dictionary de definition of racism, you might see something like discrimination uh, on the basis of race. Well, just translate that into German and, and, uh, and you'll f make people feel very uncomfortable uh, because you will rely on the German term uh, Rasse, for instance. And um, um, at least what I've, what I've been told, for instance, when it comes to uh, anti-discriminatory uh, legislation is that actually, um, this is what uh, um, a legal scholar said in a talk when it came specifically to Article 3 that says, uh, Article 3 of German basic law that says, uh, among other things, that uh, no one should be discriminated against on the basis of their race, of der Rasse is the German expression. That, uh, um, and this is just an anecdote, uh, again, from a legal scholar, uh, I'm not a legal scholar myself, um, that uh, um, judges actually felt uncomfortable to, uh, um, to um, make decisions based on that article because they did not want to subscribe to the existence of Rasse uh, in doing so. So I think um, um, there's a lot of, you might call this um, color blindness, color muteness maybe, uh, about, uh, about race in the German context. Uh, and I do think precisely because sort of a standard understanding of racism some, uh, will somehow rely on that concept uh, of race, I do, I do think that puts us in a, in, a, in a precarious position when it comes to, uh, um, to addressing various racisms, especially when we're talking about things that are not just in the heart or in the head. I think uh, then the challenge gets um, particularly uh, weighty for us. Um, and uh, there are obvious historical reasons for why there is this discomfort, of course, but I don't think that's all that there is to this story. Um, I do think also that um, uh, there's a sort of, you know, some people call this like German exceptionalism uh, that we sort of, that, uh, Germany has learned from its past mistakes and to some extent we're sort of beyond, uh, beyond that uh, and then uh, addressing maybe that, you know, as I would prefer to say, you know, racialization still, still is an issue uh, would of course be uh, a challenge to that view. So I think these are sort of very peculiar German problems. So on, the one, on the one hand, lots of German angst, so to speak, over um, uh, over race, over Rasse, very specifically. But I also do think um, yeah, a particular kind of very German smugness uh, about uh, the, um, how German has come, Germany has come to terms with its history, or, yeah, or not, for that matter. Christina, could you also talk to this question? Because you did a lot of work literally translating and editing uh, texts from the US context in philosophy and making them accessible to the uh, German discussion, and obviously this requires a kind of translation that goes beyond translation in a narrow uh, sense. So, you know, thinking about how these concepts then relate to and might need to be revised in light of um, the specificities also of the German context. I mean, and in, in, this, in, in the light of this work, I mean, how do you see this resistance to notions of racism, and especially structural racism, um, and maybe also the ways in which to respond to it philosophically from your own experience. I mean, yeah, is there a specific challenge to philosophers um, getting their head around this, these notions? Because the discipline itself seems to be, I mean, not to overrate philosophy's importance, but it stands out, you know, negatively maybe as not being particularly good in it will mildly addressing its own history of um, producing and reproducing racism both you know, on the on the conceptual, but also on the institutional um, level. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, there are so many things to say here, so I don't don't really know where to start. Um, talking about philosophy, I would actually sort of like to hear what uh, Daniel's experiences over the past two or three years have been, um, because you've done so much on Hegel and colonialism, and I'm actually sort of wondering how what what sort of how people have reacted to that. But so, if my experience with maybe you can talk. To about that later, I, I would would love to hear more about uh, about this. Um, so my experience is it was kind of interesting, and um, because I think philosophers, like the mainstream of philosophy, doesn't take itself to be interested in any kinds of questions that have to do with the social world or anything like that. And so it's been interesting for me because I mean. Um, sort of doing my PhD in philosophy and so on, like no one really at the time talked about racism, at least in Germany. Um, but turning to the US, which is so 
like, you know, we all look to the US and the sort of English language departments and it's like so great and the philosophy is so much better than the philosophy we are doing. And it, it's been kind of interesting the effect that since people like Sally and other people like Charles Mills, Tommy Shelby, et cetera, et cetera, like all these well-known philosophers have actually sort of done research on race and racism for like over 20 years, that has really helped legitimize kind of bringing that to the German context. And now sort of my colleagues are kind of saying, oh, okay, people at MIT or at Harvard, they are actually sort of interested in racism. So, mm, okay, it could be like a legitimate uh, topic for philosophers to sort of discuss. So that's kind of, that's kind of interesting. I mean, that's just one kind of anecdote about how I, how I experience it. Um, I mean, in general, I would say sort of looking more at the public debate and the resistance that there is kind of ignorance and something like blatant ignorance. And I mean, there is like a kind of more innocent ignorance. I mean, BAFTA already um, talked about it, that there are many people in the public debate who hold the view that structural racism basically just means widespread individual racism. And Wolfgang Thierse, a well-known social democrat and a former president of the German parliament, um, he basically wrote like a big opinion piece in a conservative newspaper, uh, the FAZ, uh, two years ago, that to say that um, there's structural racism means to say that uh, racism is everywhere. And since racism, like only individuals can be racist, that means basically that when you say that racism is everywhere, you say that all individuals are racist or all white individuals are racist. And so this is just a huge misunderstanding and it can probably count as a form of ignorance because I don't know anyone like who seriously works on the concept of structural racism <laughs> who actually employs sort of the term in that kind of way. But so there is this kind of misunderstanding going on and perhaps the hope would be that you could convince the Wolfgang Thierses of this world that structural racism is something different. But you can see that there's like this kind of resistance to being labeled a racist because there is like, you know, people think that they are being called out as racists and um, they don't want to be called racists. And I think that explains part of the resistance. But then there's also like blatant ignorance. And like, I think I, I recently read this very harrowing interview uh, with uh, that the uh, SZ, like a liberal newspaper, did with Karim Feredoni and Norbert Reul. Norbert Reul is currently the Minister of the Interior in North Rhine-Westphalia, like a German state. And like basically to sum up the position of Reul, like he was basically just saying, I know, I just know that there is no racism within the German police. And also we don't need any social scientific research on this because there are, you know, you have one study saying this, you have another study contradicting it. And so, you know, just trust me, I know that it's all going to be fine. And this is what I would call like blatant ignorance. Like there's just, like he doesn't want to know, right? And I think people like him like should be called out. And that like that's really a sign of like a deeper resistance of like someone not wanting to get into a serious discussion of what it would mean um, to tackle like institutional and structural racism. Thanks, Daniel, do you wanna jump in? Just a very quick uh, uh, follow-up that also connects to what you just said, because I, I realize I only had answered half of your question that way. Because um, you also asked what philosophy uh, uh, might be uh, might contribute. Obviously, all of us have, have a lot to say about that, but uh, one thing I just thought was uh, specifically about the contestedness of this. I thought, well, well if, it's one good, if there's one thing that philosophers are fairly good at is, uh, uh, um, well, at least to some extent, uh, sorting out these kind of, you know, uh, Disputes over you know, what does the does the concept mean this thing that thing what exactly is going on what where's the action here so you might say um, if if there's a dispute over whether the, the German police is structurally racist or not then uh, and that's not just a factual dispute that's also a dispute about uh, uh, well what kind of what concept is, is at play here um, um, and then you might ask following that well what are the practical implications of that concept and then maybe you, you find out that. A part of the dispute is maybe due to um, you know, what kind of actions might be called for, and maybe people are just not so willing to do those things. So maybe philosophy can help a little bit in sort of pulling these things uh, apart. Uh, and then I think a second thing, maybe, <laughs> uh, I don't know if I'm being too optimistic about this, but um, I, I just mentioned some of the conceptual issues take, you know, again, the German context. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe if, um, Rasse talk is just too fraught in the German context. Uh, but having no concept at all, at all doesn't put us in a good uh, uh, position uh, either um, to, you know, um, uh, for empirical inquiry into racism or these kind of things. Uh, then 
uh, you know, various disciplines, social sciences, history, um, they, they will have to develop um, alternatives that can still help us understand these phenomena. phenomena. I do think philosophy uh, can have a valuable contribution to make there. For instance, maybe something like, that would be something I'd be interested in, um, accounting for racism in terms of racialization, for instance, and, um, and seeing what, what kind of work that concept uh, could do. Uh, and and uh, and how it might fare as a as a replacement in that case uh, for the concept of race in the German context at least different things might apply in different contexts but um, I, I do think these are uh, potentially valuable contributions that philosophy can make. Yeah. Thank you. So um, before we open it up, I would like to have one um, more round on the panel on and return to anti-racist struggles. Um, and Bafta, maybe to start with you this round. Um, I mean, you, you've also been um, a constructive critic, let's say, of a lot of anti-racist struggles, and uh, especially of the sometimes too maybe reformist or moralistic or individualist or liberal orientation of some of the uh, struggles that we've seen in the field of anti-racism uh, in, in Germany and beyond. Um, but on the other hand, one might think that emphasizing the structural nature of racism and emphasizing that anti-racism means being interested in structural or systemic transformation um, might make it very difficult to imagine what anti-racist work in the here and now could consist in given that a fundamental structural transformation doesn't seem to be on the horizon. So if we can only really be anti-racist if we um, you know, question and transform the system, but the system seems to be pretty stable, then what's the horizon for anti-racist struggle? I mean, is, is there a kind of trade-off or tension between being oriented towards the structural systemic logic of, for example, racial domination in a capitalist society and the kind of emancipatory politics of these struggles? How does this tension get articulated and navigated in your, in your view? Um, yeah, I think that's a very good question because I think that is also the reason um, why we need um, to fill the concept of um, structural racism with an actual um, um, understanding of what that actually means. Um, for it not to be this, um, I don't know, empty concept to, um, just say that you know that there are like many racist people in the society, and I think an understanding of structural racism um, that is also political would be essential. Just to pick up on the anecdote you just told, Christina, I think this is a very good example why it's important to have a political understanding of the concept. Um, you, Daniel, you t also talked about um, actions, and I think uh, when people completely deny the existence of racism or structural racism within the police. I think we have to understand this not only as some kind of misunderstanding or in ignorance, but as a political denial of this concept. Because understanding racism as structural would mean something very different than understanding it as something individual that has very um, different political implications. And I think the political solutions we um, may propose for these problems. So I think when we talk about the systemic, um, of course, what we are saying, especially with our book and with the critique you just um, talked about is that it's not, an, it's not enough to talk about racism just in an anti-discrimination sense because it has systemic roots and some kind of system transformation would be necessary to abolish racism. But what we are also saying is that an understanding of racism means to understand how, um, you said the system is very stable, how racism contributes to the fact that the system is stable. So um, different forms of anti-racism work could also be part of a transformatory understanding of um, political struggle. And I talked about, you know, campaigns against racist police violence. Of course, this is not in itself revolutionary, but I think it could highlight a specific problem, a specific systemic issue that exists within the society. And when we are able to connect these issues to other issues that also exist within society, I think Black Lives Matter showed how a protest that was initially about racist police violence 
kind of spread and now we talk about different forms of racism within society, there's also a potential to connect these discussions to something larger and um, then to talk about um, what are different ways to organize against racism, against capitalism. But within this organizing, I think we need to have some kind of consciousness raising, um, not first, but I think it has to be kind of, um, what's the word? Against? Complementary. Complementary, exactly. It has to be kind of complementary because I think at this point in Germany, we talk about racism a lot, but the way we talk about racism, I think, um, is kind of problematic because um, this liberal anti-racism we criticize sometimes can contribute to stabilizing the system. When we talk about, you know, a diverse police or, you know, anti-racism workshops for the police, I think this is something that will, um, that's not like um, an issue that will fix the problem, but in the long run, it will make it more difficult to talk about this issue. So I think this is a um, problematic understanding of racism that we um, have to raise some consciousness about. And I think this kind of discursive work we are doing is also, I would say, essential. So I think the first step would be to develop some kind of structural understanding of racism. Thank you. Um, Sally, I mean, we will hear more from you about the relation between the structural forms of other reproduction of the existing order and the possibilities of agency in your uh, Benjamin lectures, but mm -hmm. could you give us a brief <laughs> version of uh, your answer of how, you know, the structural um, logic um, uh, of domination and the, and the hopefully transformative agency of social struggles, how they can be thought together? Yes, thanks. Um, so I have a view of this complex dynamic system that society is that it's not just one structure and we've got to find the crack in it and break it, but it's this dynamic process with, with many different um, logics that are competing for attention and competing for adherence and competing to be materialized. And um, so there are many different entry points that, that you can begin to address th the problem. And, and, and because the system, in my view, is made up of practices and these, all these practices in these different spaces and domains, that intervention can be at the, a kind of more micro level or meso level um, in order to try and address the, the bigger structure. And, and I'm, on activism, I mean, I think it's, it's um, my own activism is complicated because I'm a white woman and I believe that it's important um, in the anti-racist struggle to be explicitly and outspokenly and committedly anti-racist. But I also believe that um, my, my role is service, um, that I am there as part of the movement to serve and to support and to use my words as a powerful person in the academy in whatever way I can. Um, and so, but one of the ways has been most meaningful to me is doing the kind of more mutual aid work, the more on the ground work of building up communities where they're doing alternative education, right? Where do you get a good black education? You get it through the black church, right? You go so the black church in the United States is a is a domain where where there's an incredible amount of activism, both in the kinds of mutual aid, but you know, as King was using um, in the civil rights movement, and so and so crossing color lines and and participating in these efforts of mutual aid or in these efforts of education or in these efforts to empower communities so that they can you know, confront the problems that are facing them on their own terms and not necessarily on my terms, that's really important to me. And although I am an activist and I am an organizer and I try to do these multiple things, I think there's this other place on the ground material support um, that, that makes a difference, 
because it empowers communities. It empowers communities when, when they are struggling and suffering to come up with an alternative. So in, in Boston, for example, there are a lot of community-based organizations, some through the church and some independent of the church, who are working on defund the police. And, and that's a, extremely important because, and, and also returning citizens, there's this phrase, returning citizens, which means felons who've been released from prison come back into the community, and there are all kinds of hurdles that they face. There's, um, there's organizations to help with gangs and gang violence. And so these, these organizations need support and they need, um, you know, committed people um, of all races to be involved so that they can have the strength to ally themselves with the state and take some power over from the state in order for to defund the police to work. And so that's where I think that, you know, we gotta do that on the ground in the communities. And anyway, that's, but that's structural change, right? If we, can, if we can change what happens to felons when they come out, if we can change what happens to gang members, you know, when they're found with a gun or a gang member who wants to relieve the, leave the gang, or if we can take powers away from the police in order to put it in community organizations, I really think that's structural change. And, and you can't do it without the work on the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, Daniel, you mentioned earlier that racism is also materialized in the infrastructures which shape our, our daily life, let's say, for example, in the city. Um, if that's the case, I mean, how do you go about thinking about anti-racist struggles and their transformative power? I mean, on the one hand, one might think, well, you know, that's not too difficult. You just have to think building different roads, etc. But that's probably too easy a thought or too naive. Um, so what's your view on the avenues of social change, given that embeddedness of racism in the often invisible infrastructures of our lives. It's funny, uh, last week I had a brief conversation with Bafta uh, about this topic and I said, uh, th th uh, bringing up the whole sort of material side is gonna put me in an awkward position when this, when this question comes up. <laughs> I, I do think it does put me in an awkward position because sort of, you know, from a, you know, from a leftist activist organizing standpoint, it might be awkward because of course, I guess the first agent you were to think of when it, come, when it comes to these kind of changes would be the state. Uh, and uh, I mean, this would be something I'd be very curious uh, to explore, maybe here, maybe elsewhere, um, you know, thinking of alternatives to that. But um, um, because, uh, uh, because uh, th these are the kind of structures that are otherwise so um, um, so hard to change. Um, it, I, yeah, I, I, I currently struggle seeing ways of uh, of even addressing them, sort of, um, w without reliance on the state. So that's that's why I feel a bit awkward about uh, about this uh, this particular phenomenon. I, you, you did mention the uh, the invisibility of it, um, and I do think. Um, I mean, a, a lot of work there is just going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be conceptual work, it's going to be empirical work, it's, but it's also going to be activist work to the point that, uh, um, we have so little data about all these phenomena and how they bear on racialization. Um, so, uh, one, one example I like to, I like to bring up in this concept, uh, in this context is for instance, the Afro census. I don't know if you've, if you've heard of that, but this is the attempt from, um, from uh, several um, organizations, but among, among them, uh, each one, Teach One, which is a, is a black political organization, um, to, to gather, gather data on, on anti-black racism, basically. Uh, why is that so difficult otherwise? Well, because in official statistics, we, we lack uh, the relevant categories to even gather such data. We have, as you might know, for a long time, the standard category used in Germany was that of migration. Background. Uh, this is put on. This is put on hold right now. People are looking for alternatives, but one problem is that uh, migration background does not track racialization. So uh, you can be very much uh, racialized as uh, as black, for instance. And just to mention one case, but there are of course several others, um, uh, but not have a migration background. So demographically speaking, you would be invisible uh, because of that. Um, but that just means that we just lack. Um, 
uh, a lot of data. We have a, a, a massive gaping racial data gap, so to speak. Um, um, you, can, you have lots of proxies. Uh, you have things about employment, about housing, about like which neighborhoods uh, have what kind of what mortality rates with, uh, with regard to COVID-19, but you have like a big race or racialization shaped hole uh, in these data. Um, and I do think um, a first step, I mean, this is very similar to, uh, I, I think at least very similar to the part of what uh, Buffalo said before as well. Uh, a lot of this will be you know, the, the theoretical work as well. Uh, a part of this will be empirical work, but the empirical work itself requires mobilization because, um, uh, because activist groups have to even push uh, for gathering these data. And not all groups will be uh, equally, um, uh, will, be, will be fully aligned with this. And you know, different groups will have, have uh, somewhat different interests. Uh, there are many reasons why uh, um, um, groups such as, um, and, there, and organizations such as the uh, Central Council uh, for Sinti and Roma in Germany, or the, um, uh, the Central Jewish Council in Germany, uh, are somewhat resistant to gathering these data. So there are many worries about, again, here we come back to the state again, yeah, uh, uh, to state overreach and too much state access to data. So that there, there, are, um, there are interesting issues that have to be resolved, and they have to be resolved in, in coalitions uh, of groups that are likewise affected um, and negatively affected here. Uh, by racialization, and that too is, of course, activist work that has to be done. That's just like the very first uh, uh, step, just to sort of gain some understanding uh, of what is going on. But I do think this is a crucial step. That I'm not sure to which extent that answers your question, but at least it's uh, one answer I can think of. Thank you, um, Christina. In 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 the edited book, but also in in some other work. I mean, you have looked at both. Uh, let's say the kind of ontological questions, what is race, um, on which level does it manifest in which ways, and also at, um, let's say, you know, let's say norm normative questions in political and moral philosophy that come up. Um, I mean, what is, what is your sense of the philosophical debates here? I mean, as, as I suggested towards BAFTA, I mean, there might be a certain understanding on which the, the, the deeper the ontological analysis is of the structural nature of racism, the less there seems to be room for you know, individual or even collective uh, agency or responsibility. I mean, how, how does this tension get resolved in your view? In the, or you know, is, it, is, it, is it a tension in the first place? And if so, um, how does it get resolved in the philosophical debates you're, you're looking at? Um, well, I think there are like two dangers. I think sort of one danger is and that's like a danger I have to deal with in my work on institutional racism, that you ignore basically the larger context in which this is taking place. Um, and so I think to talk about structural racism, also in the sense that Wafta highlighted that it's like multiple institutions, the law, et cetera, et cetera, interacting to produce certain outcomes, that is import like an important step um, to make visible at what level or what kind of challenge we are actually facing. But of course, there is a second danger that comes with that, because as soon as we talk about <laughs> that there's structural racism, full stop, um, that can easily, I think, have kind of debilitating effects in a sense of, well, if, if racism is really structural, then it's like really kind of huge and can appear almost like immutable and hard to sort of, yeah, hard to change. So I think that is a, like a very serious danger. And I think, um, but I don't think it's sort of necessarily attention because I think what is important for all of us to do is sort of to um, kind of break racism down in terms of sort of analyzing like or to remember that racism is something that exists in concrete forms at very concrete sites in the social world and that we can sort of study the specific mechanisms uh, through which it operates etc cetera, etc cetera, and perhaps also identify um, sort of sites for intervention um, and so I think talking of structural racism is necessary to, yeah, as I said before, to make clear um, that like the challenge is huge, but that structural racism is not this kind of abstract monster, but actually sort of consists of like m many, many different kinds of phenomena um, that we can actually sort of, and that is kind of important, I think, for also politically to sort of to break it down. And I think I'm more optimistic than 
BAFTA and perhaps we should, I'm, I'm not, not sure we have time, talk a bit about the whole debate on abolitionism um, because I think it would make a huge difference if we defunded the police, for instance, that would make a palpable sort of difference in social life, even though we would still, like the problem you mentioned of migration control, of course, that, that doesn't go away, but still it would make a difference. And so I think we can actually sort of identify sites um, where we, where it might be possible to change something. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. So it's not necessarily attention. Thank you. We have still time, but um, I would like to use that time to open it up to the audience as well. So if you have comments, questions, preferably questions um, for uh, the panel, please raise your hand. I will try to take a uh, note. So let leave your hand up for the time being and there will be um, several mics in uh, the audience. So I mean, maybe you can start yes. right in front of you. Yeah, on the right. We'll take two or three questions together and then uh, ask the panelists to respond. Please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the panel and thank you for the interesting conversations. Um, I think my question is more question on, oh, a question on your thoughts, um, particularly on violence. I know racism is conceptualized as something that's violent. Um, but when we're looking at it from structural, institutional, or systemic mechanisms, especially if we're analyzing the ways in which it's integrated into our daily lives, we don't conceptualize our daily lives as violent, especially in the Western world. Um, so when we're talking about anti-racist work, how do you integrate concepts of violence in a way that is teachable to people and that lands and impacts them the way that racism impacts those that are affected by it. I think it's a very difficult thing to do because there are some scholars who do so, but then are labeled as radical, are often dismissed. And I think also when we conceptualize racism as violence, we have the tendency of pathologizing people and um, promoting images of um, people who are subjected to racial violence in ways that are insensitive. So. Yeah, I'm just curious about that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Then in the back on the left side, um, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, thanks again for the talk as well. So um, I guess we can all agree that reducing racism to an individual phenomenon is neither useful nor accurate. Um, and as Sally Hasslinger pointed out, on one hand, um, it is erasing responsibility. But also, um, I think from like a theoretical, but also an activist point of view, um, it's also a problem that um, oftentimes white people engage in a debate that is um, only focused on like privileges and how they're you know privileged and um, focused on personal white guilt. And I feel like that's also a too individualist um, debate around racism that's not really focused on overcoming the structures or not uh, assuming that it's a structure um, as well. So I was wondering whether you see that as a problem as well. What's your perspective on that? And then maybe if you have any idea on how to shift the debate to something that's more structural. Thank you. And then there was a question right next, um, I think, to you. And then we'll have the panel respond. Uh, yes, thank you as well for the interesting input. It was really insightful. And uh, I want to start with saying that there's the saying, you can't do right in the wrong system. And I think we can all agree that when it comes to anti-racism, that it's important to stand up in our daily lives and uh, that you could always speak up uh, for people. However, looking at the broader scope, and uh, now I'm referring to what BAFTA Sabo said, um, within this system that is inherently racist, because capitalism originates in colonialism and therefore also in slavery, do you think that it wouldn't be the logical consequence to um, yeah, change the system overall and therefore uh, like start a revolution. Maybe this is a little bit too much of an activist point, but I'm always thinking, okay, what can we do? And I feel like with the way our system is inherently racist, it's really hard to change it. So 
I'm wondering whether you think there are fruitful and sustainable ways to change yeah, our system, or do we have to actually act now, especially with like looking at climate change, how much time we've left? So yeah, I got a little lost in my words, but thanks. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. So let's start with these uh, three questions. Who would like to start to respond? Lefter, do you want to start? Um, I will start from the back because that question was directed to me. Um, I mean, if you ask this directly, of course, I would say we need a revolution. <laughs> um, but then the question would be, what would that look like? What would that be? I think a lot of people have very different concepts of what that would mean. And I think the first step would be um, to um, kind of... Um, prepare a situation where this kind of change would even be possible because I think at the stage we are in now it doesn't make sense to talk about um, to talk about anti-racist work in this sense because like there's no revolution on the horizon and there's like no force in society that would be able to bring this about so I would think that to abolish racism in its entirety that would of course be necessary because I think um, what I understand as structural racism, capitalist class society drives this kind of social relation that um, I would say um, always will bring up some kind of racial ideology. And I think um, that doesn't really, I, don't, I think you made a good point, Christina, about um, this kind of notion sometimes being debilitating because um, the structure can be so big and this whole issue can seem so huge that people would think, okay, there's nothing I can do in my day-to-day -day life. And I think um, that's why it's important to understand racism in a political sense, as a political dynamic, as a power dynamic that can also be changed. That doesn't mean it will be abolished, but I think um, part of bringing about this, you know, um, social force, this kind of social organization that would be able to change society in a meaningful way. We have to understand that um, racism within the police is also something you can at least, um, yeah, I would say um, change somewhat. Defunding the police would be one way. I think there's also a possibility of changing somewhat of the legal framework in Germany that would um, lessen the opportunity of the police to do racial profiling. I also think that um, lessening some kind of uh, privileges a lot of uh, police have in just do racial profiling could be limited. So I think there are there is something you could do. There are little things, of course, in your day-to-day -day life when you just see somebody um, insulting someone on the street, you should always speak up. You should always like go to the person, ask, hey, are you okay? Is there something I can do? Um, if you see the police just like profiling people, there's also something you can do. You can ask the people if they need, for example, a witness. Um, you know, you can um, assist people. There's a lot of stuff you can do on your day-to-day -day life. I think the biggest misconception would be that this will be enough to abolish racism. And I don't think anybody would say it this directly, but it's sort of implied in the way we talk about racism, um, especially within the past years. And that's something I would criticize. That doesn't mean uh, there's no value in the little things you can do. Um, yeah, maybe also referring to the other question about privilege, I think um, what you said in the question also relates to a lot of the stuff I would criticize about the current debate about racism because when we talk about racist police violence, I don't think anybody, any victim of racist police violence is helped if um, a white person sits there and checks their privilege and says something like, we have to do better. We don't know what that means. And also, you are not the police as a random white person, so you are not responsible for racist police violence. We have to understand how the police as an institution functions. And even if you are, maybe you don't experience racial profiling, but there are different groups in society that experience police violence. Um, homeless people, people who use drugs, leftist people, you know, and I think when we talk about racial profiling, racist police violence, the bigger, potential would be to connect this debate to other debates about 
um, police violence that exists within society to, bro to also bring about larger coalitions of different people that maybe share this specific interest. And I think this would also be a good step in the right direction to, um, you know, bring, um, yeah, to kind of bring about this force that could also lead to a larger change within society. And I think the first step would be to um, maybe move on from this debate on, you know, who's privileged, who's not privileged. I think, of course, there are people in society who have it worse, but I don't think in a broader sense that most white people are privileged. It's quite the opposite, actually. And I think the most important step would be to understand that um, there are very few people in the society who are privileged, and the vast majority is not. And understanding this would be the first step to understand that we share this common interest of changing the society. So anti-racist work is not something that um, divides people, that separates people into different interests, different identities, but that has the pol potential to bring different good groups of people together to um, understand what it means to form these kinds of coalitions and to not only talk about racism, but also other issues that relate to this. So. Yeah, maybe just that. Thank you so much. Um, so I think in some ways the first question about violence is, is the hardest for me um, because I do think that uh, showing violence um, against people of color and, um, is a kind of victimization porn. I mean, it can get to the point where it's just, oh, horrible, 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 and it can be pathologizing, et cetera. Um, but you do want to make vivid the extent of the, of the violence. And there's one artist whose work I think is fascinating and, and it is trying to address this question. And I can't remember the artist's name and I don't want to look on my phone right now. Um, but what he did is it, during the lynchings um, in, under Jim Crow in the South, um, there were people who, it was Kodak had just made its sort of camera for the ordinary person and people would take pictures and send postcards and you could sign up for a, a mailing list to get postcards of the lynching. And there are lots and lots of these postcards left and what he did is he cut out the, the figure of the black, typically black man who was lynched so that all you could see was the the joy and fascination of the white people looking at this, what had been a cut out space. So it was removing the, bo the, the violated body in order for white people to reflect on themselves in their own fascination with that violence. And it seemed to me that there was a, there can be in art like that a very powerful, uh, or a kind of impulse to self-reflection or push to self-reflection to sort of see, okay, what would you do and how would it be and how horrifying would it be? Because the, the image of a lynching is, is already fairly well known, but to shift it this way, I think is really powerful. But I don't have many good ways to do this and that was just one that came to mind. Um, uh, in terms of, a racing response. So I think that a big question that I didn't really address that was implicit in something that Robin asked me about with the Florida situation and the education and all of that is um, the deep, deep individualism, at least in the United States, and even invoking the First Amendment. It's, oh my God, it's, it's very much about uh, individual rights. And I think the, the biggest challenge that we have in moving past white guilt and, and sort of taking responsibility is trying to move past that sense of individualism. And I do think it's connected to toxic masculinity. So there was something that Bafta said about the masculinity and the independent and individual who's perfectly capable of taking care of themselves and are only responsible for what they do. That is an ideology that is very deep in the United States. And how to combat it is a much bigger question. It's also embedded in Christian Protestantism in the US. So Christian, you know, Protestantism, you get your own relationship with Jesus. You don't have to go through the Pope, whatever. And it's very, it's very, so the Christian right is very individualistic. And so I don't know how to deal with that in a, in a substantial way, but that has to happen. 
And then um, I, I do think that there are small revolutions. I think that the civil rights movement was, was um, a major revolution, although it was not violent, it was committed to nonviolence, but it didn't, but it's, you know, we still have a lot of work to do, right? That was, that was a major change. And I'm these days as interested, if not more, in racial uplift, it's called, and racial self-determination and economic um, empowerment. So I believe that because um, African Americans and other racial minorities are, um, they, it's very difficult for them to constitute a voting block. Um, they need anti-racists to vote with them, of course, but I think that if they can have greater power, they can have more self-determination, um, more economic empowerment where they're not necessarily reliant on um, the system of capitalism as we know it, but a kind of solidarity economy. I think that that is an important set of moves and it's that's part of the mutual aid work and the service work I was doing to build up and empower a community so they have voice and that voice can play a much more substantial role in how, how things evolve. Yeah, these were really um, difficult uh, questions and uh, both Bafna's and Sally's responses were really quite great so I hope I can add a little bit to it. Um, I also wanted to speak to the question about you know, individualism uh, when it comes to questions of responsibility um, for structural racism and maybe even connected to, to uh, privilege talk. I, I, I agree that I guess the fact that most of our moral vocabulary is tailored to individual actions and responsibility for individual actions that um, it is um, so, you know, uh, our received moral vocabulary is is um, is not very apt to dealing with these phenomena, and I think that can have uh, um, two consequences, at least maybe more. Uh, one of them is, and this is basically with the, as with the police example, people just break down the phenomenon into a phenomenon for which individuals are responsible, and you know that's quite overwhelming. So people might reject that altogether. Um, uh, but the other could be that people. Uh, if they think this is a matter of individual responsibility, individual agency, uh, they might just focus on the kind of things that are within their individual agency. You, know, and you might not be able to change uh, the overall structure of society, but you know you can always check your privilege, um, uh, or maybe you can call out people for not doing so sufficiently. Um, so uh, I do think sort of the I, I agree with the diagnosis that the um, the individualist account is. Uh, is, is too narrow, uh, but um, that we have to, I, I guess, to some extent, even engineer um, norm a normative, alternative normative vocabulary that helps us deal uh, with these phenomena. And this is not just a problem for discussions about structural racism, but there's been an ongoing philosophical debate about uh, structural injustice more broadly and questions of responsibility. And I think there might be lots of fruitful things we could find there for this odd position somewhere between you know, being an individual perpetrator and a mere bystander, say. Uh, and it's pretty clear that probably most people, are, uh, when it comes to phenomena such as structural racism, uh, are not really at these poles, but somewhere in between. And uh, there's an interesting, there are interesting questions to be raised there. I'm, I'm just not quite sure um, there is no use whatsoever for talk of privilege. I'm not sure. Um, I'm thinking, for instance, let's say, let's say we think of structural racism as a matter of, of power, among other things, but maybe it's a matter of power, and it is a matter of how different uh, groups are empowered and disempowered you know, by virtue of different social structures. Um, one might think, for instance, that you know, uh, if certain things are in one's power by virtue of one's social position, then maybe one has also has certain obligations um, uh, to, um, to do what is within what's, uh, one's power, and maybe uh, a more productive way in thinking of uh, uh, privilege and what uh, obligations might follow from that could be something like that. Um, uh, I'm, uh, this is something I, I, I've only just begun thinking about, so I don't have a very well-developed um, opinion on that. Quickly, just on the, on the issue of change, again, I think uh, everything that uh, what uh, Bafta and Sally have said so far is, uh, is already very helpful. Um, maybe just my own two cents. 
uh, at the beginning I mentioned that I like to think of racialization as this bundle of sticks. You can really think that the bundle altogether, that's like unbreakable, right? Um, but um, uh, of course you can look at all those, um, all those sticks sort of individually, and these could be like different mechanisms um, that lead to racial subordination. You know? uh, and uh, so uh, if we're uh, in a position to identify what these sticks are, uh, that will of course suggest certain courses uh, for action. And I do think we, um, to some extent, I know um, there might be cause for skepticism if we think that many of these things are like reinforcing or like something else might sort of take its place or something like that. Uh, but uh, I, I could think of sort of abolishing uh, racism stick by stick, so to say, um, um, in this, uh, on this account, right? Uh, this is sort of a very abstract way of putting it, but I think that's sort of the account that, uh, the, the, the approach that the account would suggest. Um, I, I don't have that much to say about the violence point, I'm afraid. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, maybe we can uh, discuss it in more detail later. Um, I, I was thinking about it as I wasn't quite sure what I could uh, contribute in addition to what was already said, so I apologize for that. I don't think I have anything substantial to add, and I would prefer to hear more questions. Okay, we have time for a, a quick final round of questions. Um, so uh, there's one here in the front, and then uh, two here in the middle part. So could you give the mic to Christian here first, and then, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you. I would like to come back to the, to the question of race, because I'm one of these guys who's really... Um, uncomfortable speaking about race, and I think there are very good reasons for not thinking that race is a substantial concept in the sense of biology and so on. I understand, however, that it is a social reality, and I found it quite interesting that you managed to speak about structural racism all the time without ever coming back to race as a, as a concept. So you mentioned it, Daniel, uh, sometimes, but in your analysis, it doesn't play a, a big role. So I was wondering if you wouldn't agree that structural racism might be a way of understanding how race becomes a social reality without being a biological or some si something like a substantial way. And if this is so, wouldn't we have to say a bit more about what structural racism actually is beyond the point of that there is a migration regime uh, which then brings the police to, um, um, to make racial profiling because it has this power to, to create this kind of social reality. Mm -hmm. And let's take the two questions here in front of you, Amin. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, thanks so much for your statements and the discussion. So over the stretch of the last couple of years in Germany, it seems as, seems as if the study of structural racism has been divorced from the study of anti-Semitism. Though obviously anti-Semitism as an important dimension of structural racism would um, inform us about how race works vis-a-vis -vis also religion, vis-a-vis -vis culture, vis-a-vis -vis discrimination, and vis-a-vis -vis genocide. And so by divorcing uh, racism and anti-Semitism, clearly what we have now is, or the state is invested in creating a hierarchy, uh, an epistemological hierarchy, and hierarchies in funding, hierarchies in public attention, uh, hierarchies in legal norms, we see that also playing out in the legal field. And in fact, then when it comes to anti-racist struggles, then we see that communities are being pitched against each other at the very expense of understanding uh, who's been, who, you know, who benefits from racism, basically, right? And so maybe uh, my question would be then uh, to you um, how basically, you know, what, 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 what is there that you can offer coming from your respective fields vis-a-vis -vis this very, let's say, novel divorce and basically how to overcome that divorce in these two in these two fields, because I think we are at a very crucial point here in Germany where that divorce is also creating new types of racism towards a particular group that is actually being caught in between the anti-Semitism and racism um, 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 discussion. And in particular, as we could see on the streets of Berlin, let's bring this also back to Berlin, um, and how like Palestinians were stripped of their constitutional right to protest because exactly of these kind of debates that we're not having. Okay, and then there was a question, I think, next to you. 
Um, yeah, hi. Um, so, Daniel, you talked about like the terminology of race, and especially like in the German context. And um, I was just wondering um, if it is necessary to, you know, be able to talk about it um, and use the German term, even though there are so many emotions surrounding it. And, you know, we're on one side have like our past history, and then the other side, we kind of like are trying to, to prove or show that we've overcome all of that. And um, yeah, and I was just like wondering if it's necessary to actually have, um, to use those terms to have an open and honest discussion about race and racism and um, to actually be able to not only recognize it, but also accept, you know, its reality. Um, and from there on out, you know, to kind of like find ways to, um, yeah, to, to, to work against it, right, and to, to solve it and somehow. And, um, but at the same time, um, I'm also wondering, like, because if you only use the, the English word, at least in Germany, then you're also actively excluding people, you know, and, and it's also like the whole debate is actually like kind of like taking place on like an academia sort of like level. And so n I don't want to, you know, like be hung up on, you know, one term or whatever, but at the same time, I do think it's very important because w it is important to, you know, include everyone in that debate and give everyone a voice, but also kind of like make everyone understand um, the importance of, of, um, of the issue. Thank you. So we have 10 minutes left. Uh, please select what you would like to respond to, and we'll start with Christina this time. Um, okay, then just very, <laughs> a very short answer to Christian's question is yes. Um, I think the category of race is something that emerges from like a racist system or racist society from structural racism. And then, of course, you would have to spell out the details, what this means in detail. But for instance, every act of discrimination, if we talk about discrimination, reproduces the very same groups that are being discriminated against. Um, so yeah, and I think we probably all agree that racialization is something um, that happens through racism and is not um, prior to it. So that's a very short answer. And I would just like to say something about the um, question of anti-Semitism because, yeah, I, I, I think I very much agree with your diagnosis and I think we would need to talk more about how racism and anti-Semitism actually sort of hang together. And it's really awkward in the German context to be talking about racism where, you know, because of everything that has happened, I mean, the anti-Semitism we had in Germany was a racist anti-Semitism. Um, and so it's really, but yeah, and that's, but it's also, I think, the explanation for why no one wants to really touch this issue because it's so, yeah, it's so fraught and you feel like when you're saying something in public and on video, um, you feel like everything you can say about this um, it will be kind of wrong and will sort of, um, um, yeah, bring, bring, um, bring you in deep sort of trouble. But yeah, so my understanding of this is actually that sort of, anti-Semitism is a form of racism, or at least that there are many forms of anti-Semitism that can be classified as forms of racism. And one interesting source for discussing this further is um, the sort of American um, historian, uh, George Fredrickson. He sort of wrote a comparative history of racism and anti-Semitism. That's very interesting, and that would probably be very helpful, like in the German context, to you know discuss this um, further. So yeah, but I, I, I just wanted to underscore that I really agree with your diagnosis and see the danger of these two forms of, um, yeah, <laughs> or anti-Semitism and racism being played out against each other, and we should not let that happen. Yeah, these were really great questions. Uh, and in this case, I, I feel very happy <laughs> that I have something to say in response. Um, um, very quickly to, about like race, rasse, and all these things. Uh, uh, you know, first of all, uh, you know, I, um, I agree that we should not understand uh, uh, that kind of talk in any biological sense. The interesting question is whether it would make sense in Germany to uh, be a social constructionist about Rasse, but still sort of conserve Rasse talk. You know? And I think that's sort of one thing that I've been really interested in, and that was one thing uh, that motivated much of the empirical research. That empirical research has pushed me away from that um, view because I think there are many cognitive traps, so to speak, when it comes to, uh, um, to Rasse talk, um, which is why I 
by now uh, advocate for replacing Rasse talk with uh, racialization talk, which is basically the kind of view I think you have in mind. Um, but uh, I don't think that Germans should be complacent <laughs> about these things, because I actually think the, the German ethos when it comes to uh, uh, Rasse and racialization uh, is uh, particularly perfidious, because you, you have all of this racialization going on, and you have racialized oppression going on. But at the same time, you don't really want to talk about anything that's in any way connected to it. That's what I said when I mentioned, when I used the term, uh, I don't know how ableist it is, but I couldn't think of a better one, color, color mute, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, it's a reality of which we do not speak in the German context. And, and I think, again, I think pushing for talk of racialization is one way, but I also think there are certain contexts, and here's where this shows, um, where I do think it, it makes a lot of sense still to use the German term. So I, I, I guess the kind of eliminativism, if you want to call it like that, is not an not an, uh, all or nothing option for me. I think there might be certain contexts in which it is appropriate to use the terminology, and I think those contexts are um, where the use of it is disruptive. Uh, I'll give you one example. Uh, Germans like to use racialized proxies for race. They don't talk about, they don't like talking about Rasse. They say like, you know, ethnic group and said, ethnia, they say. Yeah. Uh, I, this is an example I often mention. Um, uh, so apparently, uh, in Thilo Sarrazin's book, Germany gets rid of itself, Deutschland schafft sich ab. Um, not only was the book full of eugenics and all those things, it was full of talk of Rasse. Yeah. Uh, now, the editors were perfectly fine with the eugenics and all the other stuff, uh, but they said, yeah, you know, Rasse, maybe, yeah, maybe say ethnia instead. Yeah. But, but like nothing changed about the thinking. I think this is a very German way of dealing with this issue. Yeah. And um, so I think actually it, to say, you know what, aren't you really talking about Rasse here, would be a sort of very disruptive use. Yeah. Um, now, I think basically actually I would say, yeah, not really using the term, you're, you're mentioning it in a way, um, um, that is disruptive. Uh, and I think that's still very much useful. And I think we should keep that use in that particular context. But I think there are other contexts in which, say, for instance, social scientific research, where I think... Uh, talk of racialization would be much better uh, and would not lead us into the kind of um, yeah, cognitive traps, but also like moral problems, like you know, people feel uncomfortable with it, they don't engage with it because of that, they get defensive, whatever, all these things. Uh, long story to be told about that, happy to do that another time. Uh, uh, but that would be basically my preferred option for the German context at the very least. I do think that that, um, to address the question of the uh, divorce of um, um, discourse about racism and anti-Semitism, I do think the racialization approach has a lot to say about this. Um, my, favorite, my favorite account at the moment is, as I said, I like to think of racism as racialized oppression, and an interesting thing about racialization is, other than race, for instance, race might be a, uh, an on-off thing, but racialization comes in degrees. Uh, racialization um, can be partial, and there can be partial racialized groups or partially racialized groups. There can even be covertly racialized groups. So our talk about uh, these groups, uh, our overt talk might be ethnic, uh, it might be religious, uh, but there will be elements of racialization uh, that sort of sneak into it. Uh, um, and I think um, both anti-Muslim racism and anti-Semitism could be thought of as instances of um, partially racialized oppression, so to speak. Uh, uh, and uh, I do think that does not amount, that's why I think this, um, this approach is attractive for political reasons as well. It does not amount to sort of subsuming these phenomena under racism, but ra rather you could say, uh, well, they are um, forms of racism to the extent that racialization is involved, but they will also involve other things, including other things that might be oppressive. Yeah? So that might be also oppression tied to, for instance, um, um, tied to religion itself. Uh, independently of sort of the, the element of racialization. Um, I also think this uh, explains um, uh, what some people like to cite when they want to discuss racism against white people. <laughs> um, 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 uh, if we think, for instance, of uh, anti-Eastern European racism, we might think, uh, in this case too, uh, we have an instance of partial um, uh, racialization and indeed oppression based on that partial racialization. I think this is an attractive view um, because it uh, because it might serve as a conceptual foundation to build coalitions on this basis, on the basis of uh, of racialization. But of course, that's something we would have to uh, 
uh, we'll have to figure out in praxis. Um, yeah, in a way, implicitly, I've kind of answered the question about the uh, using the English term. I think the English term has. I think the English term can become a euphemism um, because it, well, because of the foreign language effect. Yeah, uh, it's like saying it's like saying Hitler was the leader of Germany. Yeah? Um, there's something kind of weird about that, right? Uh, and I think the reason is that it takes the um, it takes the sting of the word. But if you want to disrupt our discourse, maybe the sting that that word had, has is precisely uh, what we should care about in these contexts. Um, and that, for that reason, I am somewhat skeptical about just using the English term, because again, I think that's just a way to sort of avoid the discomfort about it. Okay. Okay, I'll try to say really slowly. So um, in connection with what has already been said, I think that the, when we think about this is going to connect two of the questions of anti-Semitism, at least in the United States, there's two forms of it. One form is a kind of biologized sort of anti-Semitism where these are a people and, you know, it's passed down through the mother and all of that, which is, I think, a pretty basic notion of, of racism um, in the tradition of race in the traditional sense. But there's also what is called cultural racism. And cultural racism is a bit different from just ethnocentrism because cultural racism reads the culture on the body. And, but it's not, it's, it sort of purports to read the culture on the body. And, um, and so it's very important for me that when I define race or when I give an account of race that, that there are markings on the body. So it's not just any form of discrimination that produces racial groups, it's a kind of of process that picks up on bodies in a, in a, that are, that is, the markings are indelible and they're associated with ancestry, et cetera. And that marking is, is triggered, um, triggers a kind of ideological response and a kind of materia, a material, a material response. Um, and I think in the case of cultural racism, this is happening. So in the United States, some people have started using this term, AMEMSA. It's an acronym for Arab, Middle Eastern, Muslim, South Asian, because Americans are kind of oblivious. And you know, South Asian, Middle Eastern, whatever, Muslim, they're all the same, right? And so there's a kind of um, a p markers of a, with a certain appearance and then they're assumed to be terrorists or you know, they have a kind of cultural projection onto that group. And then that group is currently being racialized. And so I think that that's not cultural, it's not just ethnocentrism because these groups are not of the same cult. You know, they don't have the same ethnicity. There's multiple ethnicities, but there's a kind of projected ethnicity onto them and a set of assumptions about their culture um, that is then read off the body, and that, um, and I think that this happens with anti-Semitism as well. That there's, there's a kind of cultural racism that it is, you know, something about the culture that is then projected onto ancestry and bodies and this sort of thing, and to see how these work for me. It is a way of thinking about race. It's a way of thinking about how races get formed because after all, the same thing happened with Africans, right? That was a, a cluster of cultures that then this whole idea was projected onto and then they, they came to be a race in, in that way. So I'm trying to answer those two questions. And about German, I don't know anything. <laughs> Well, then I think we're at the end of this uh, really insightful discussion. Uh, before I thank, we thank the panelists for um, this, and I hope we can continue. Um, I mean, it's obvious that we need to continue these, these discussions before we can um, uh, do so. I hope not too much time passes. Uh, I just wanted to, um, again, invite you to join us for Sally uh, Hasslinger's Benjamin Lectures, June 14 to 16. You find flyers on the seats and more information on our website, Critical Theory Berlin. Um, thanks so much to everyone on the panel, uh, Christina, Daniel, Sally, and Bafta. Thanks to everyone who asked such great uh, questions. Have a nice evening, and I hope to see you again soon. <laughs>